it's about time we dive into verbs. Up until now, we've discussed nominals, nominatives, pronominals, numbers, prepositions, so on and so forth. We haven't gotten to action words. That's what verbs are. Verbs are important. They give us meaning. Why do you say that? Well, to steal a line from Batman Begins, it's not who you are underneath. It's what you do that defines you. Verbs define the meaning of the sentence. And so we're going to see a high-level overview today about Hebrew verbs. Now, the first thing to understand about Hebrew verbs is they are derived from stems. Stems are derived from roots. We often hear about the root word. The root represents the most basic form of that word group or word family. The stem is the most basic word formed from that root. So the root is the source. The stem is not. We'll need to be mindful of this distinction as we look at verbs. A good example is melech, king, malach, to reign. It's the same root, mem, lamed, kaf. Usually the root is going to be triconsonantal, meaning three consonants. Sometimes it's biconsonantal, two consonants. The root typically doesn't have any of the noun pointing on it. It's bare, it's stripped. It's just the consonants. The stem will have the vowels. From melek, the, the root, we have maim, lamed, kaf. Not only do we get melek, king, we, got, we get melka, queen, and we get the verb malach, to reign. These are all different stems derived from the root. Just as we have in Spanish, for example, person, number, and gender is built into Hebrew verbs. So I don't have to say, yo estoy, I am, in Spanish. I could just simply say, estoy. Estoy inherently includes person and number. First person, singular. Hebrew does the same thing. Look at kathav, to cut, to write, typically in uh, the context of a covenant. That means he wrote. We don't have to include the pronoun, although it could be present. And if it is present, it might be for emphasis. So when we're talking about person, we're talking first person, second person, third person. When we're talking number, we're talking singular or plural. When we're talking about gender, we have common. Common is for first person because there's no inherent gender included in first person. Or we're talking masculine or feminine. Another way to think about common is neutral. In Greek, we have neuter. We don't have neuter in Hebrew. It's referred to as common. Now, when we're talking about verbal stems, remember, going back to root versus stem, we're looking at a specific stem of the root for that verb. And the stems can change. There are many stems when it comes to verbs. We have the cal stem. This is the one that we will learn first. Derived from the cal stem, we have the nifal stem. We also have the pl stem, the puwal stem, the hifil stem, the hithpile stem, and there are many more. The nifal through hithpile stems are all called derived stems because they are derived from the cal. So it's very important we learn the cal first. It will help us to see the other stems. Now, the verbal stem tells us two things. Number one, the type of action. And two, the voice of the action. Type refers to simple action, intensive action, or causative action. Simple action, to break. Intensive action, to shatter. Causative action, cause to break. In terms of voice, we're talking active, passive, or reflexive. Active if it's simple action, is to break. Passive, to be broken. Reflexive, 
to break oneself. Who is doing the action? That's the subject of the sentence. The subject bears the action and bears that action's voice. So if I say, David defeated Goliath, the subject is David. The action is defeated. It is active. David actively defeated Goliath. We can turn it around. Goliath was defeated by David. Here the subject is Goliath. The action is was defeated. The voice is passive. A reflexive example would be David put himself into the armor. It's reflexive. Put himself. So it reflects back on. It's circular. Whoop. Now let's talk about the stems. Cal itself is Hebrew for the word simple or one of the words for simple and it's the basic verbal stem. Hence the name. Simple. The other names are diagnostic clues about what changes are made to Cal to form that stem. But for now, just know the formal names in Hebrew of these stems. I said them earlier, I'll say them again. We've got Nifal, Puwal, Piel, Hofal, Hithpael. There are others, but these are the ones we're going to be focusing on in terms of the basics of biblical Hebrew. So Cal means simple. It's simple to identify because it's a very simple form of the stem. It also represents simple action. It's also active in voice. So simple action, active voice. We commonly refer to Cal as simple active. Then there's the Nifal. Nifal is like Cal, it's simple action, but it's passive voice, simple passive. It could also be reflexive, but for the most part, we, we view it as simple passive. Nifal derives its meaning from the cow. So whatever the cow's meaning is, Nifal simply takes that meaning and just changes it to either passive or reflexive. The Nifal diagnostics add on or augment at the beginning a preformative noon plus a hirik. And then in the stem, it puts in a pathak. And now you see why Nifal is called Nifal. It changes the vowel a little bit in kal, adds on the noon and the hirik, and it has a pathak, Nifal. Then there's the PL. PL is intensive action. It is also active in voice. To put simply, it intensifies the simple action of the cal stem. It doesn't add anything, no preformatives, but it changes the vowels within the root, within the stem. The vowels it takes are hirik, sere. Those are the diagnostic tools to identify pl. It also has a doggish forte in the second root consonant, another diagnostic marker of the pl. And then there's the puwal. Puwal is the passive intensive form of the cow. So if nifal is the passive of the cow, puwal is the passive of the pl. And note, it has different vowels. Much like the name would suggest, it has kibbits, ooh, puwal, and a pathak. And it also has the dagesh forte in the second consonant. Those are the markers of the puwal. Then there's the hithil. Hithil represents causative action in the active voice. Typically, you'll add some helping words in translation representing cause to, something like that. Hifil adds a preformative hey plus a hirik. Then it adds towards the end, we also have hirik yod. That is an addition. So the diagnostic features of the hifil are the preformative hey, hirik, plus the hirik yod later in the stem. If the hithil is causative, active action, hofal is causative, passive action. Much like the hithil, hofal adds a preformative hey, but instead of a hiric vowel, it receives comets hatuf. Remember, comets hatuf has to be in a closed syllable. However, it's going to sound a lot like the comets. Instead of a hiric yod, in the stem, we return to a pathak, hofal. Those are the diagnostic markers. We also have hithpael. This is intensive action with a reflexive voice. It's formed by adding hith or heath at the beginning. Hey, hirik, tav, shava. It also changes the stem's vowels 
to a pathak and then a sere, hence the name hithpael. You can see all of those vowels in the stem. Plus, there's a dogish forte. That dogish forte is in the second consonant of the stem. We see a similarity then between all of the intensive forms, pl, pu'al, hithpael. They all have a dogish forte in the second consonant of the stem. Simple action is the cal and nifal stems. Intensive action is pl, pu'al, hithpael. And causative action is hifil and hofal. From an active voice standpoint, we have cal, pl, hifil. From a passive voice standpoint, we have nifal, pu'al, hofal. From a reflexive voice standpoint, we have nifal and hithpael. So to see all of these stems in action, let's look at shema. Shema, that's, that's cal stem, he heard. Nishma, he was heard. Shabar, he, sh he smashed into pieces. Shubar, he was smashed into pieces. Himlik, he made king. Hamlak, he was made king. Hithchabe, he made himself. He hid himself. Some verbs just don't occur in every single stem. Ahav doesn't occur in Hofal. Diver does not occur in Cal. Sometimes verbs have completely different meanings across stems. We saw before, sometimes words intensify across stems. Other times, they just have a completely different meaning. It's important to understand that so that when you look up words in the lexicon, you know that the stem matters in terms of understanding and interpreting the word. An example is barak. In the cal, it means to kneel. In the pl, it actually means bless. So don't get tripped up over this. Just understand that the stems have various different meanings sometimes. And the only way to be sure is to look it up. So now let's break down verbs. We have verb conjugations. Conjugations are the different uh, functions of the verb that demonstrate person, number, and gender in a particular stem. Conjugations also reflect tense, as in present tense, past tense. So tense reflects the relationship of time to the subject. In English, we have the present tense. This is action that is being completed now. And that is to say, technically speaking, that's an imperfect or imperfective time aspect. We also have past tense. This is action that was completed, that is technically speaking, perfective already. Present tense, I study or I am studying. Past tense, I studied. There's also future tense. This is action that will be completed at some point in the future. I will study. Also, when we look at English, verbs can be participles, imperatives, that's a command, infinitives, so a participle or gerund, studying, I am studying, an infinitive to study, an imperative, study. So each of these conjugations demonstrate different functions. Hebrew does the same thing, but Hebrew has different ways of doing it. It has perfect, it has imperfect, it has imperative, cohortative, jussive, it has infinitive construct, infinitive absolute. It has participles. So when we're talking about the cal stem, for example, it could be conjugated in eight different ways. It all depends on the function of that verb. So in short, when it comes to Hebrew verbs, there are seven verbal stems, eight verbal conjugations. Each stem can take any one of the eight conjugations. The perfect tense reflects completed action, or it communicates a state of being. Usually, the perfect will be translated with an English past tense or a present perfect. He studied, he has studied. If it's a state of being, it will use the present tense. He is wise. If it's not a state of being, but it's some sort of perceptive type verb, or if it expresses some sort of attitude, then use the present tense in English. He knows, he loves. The Hebrew perfect actually does not have time 
aspect built into it. It derives time aspect from context. And so the perfect can go either present tense or past tense in its translation. The perfect simply shows the type of action or aspect. So in short, perfect tense reflects completed action that could be past, present, or future, depending on the context. Then there's the imperfect tense. This is incomplete action, past, present, or future. Usually, it's translated by the English present tense, I study, or future tense, I will study. It can be used for habitual, customary action. He prays regularly. It can be modal, would, could, should, may, might, can. It depends on the context. Again, imperfect has no time built into the tense. It only portrays action, the type of action. From the one doing the speaking, or in this case, the writing, the imperfect is used to reflect action in their mind that's not yet complete. Then there are commands. We have imperative. This is a second person command. The cohortative. This is the first person command. And the jussive. This is the third person command. All three of these are volitional, expressing command, wish, or desire. When it's an imperative second person, it's a direct command. These require or expect immediate action. These can also be used to make requests or demands. The cohortative does the same functions as the imperative, make a request or, or make a demand or provide a command. It can also be used to express purpose or result. To express purpose, you would translate with the helping words in order to. To express result, you would use the helping word with the result that or something equivalent. However, the cohortative is first person. So you're going to have to add some helping words in the translation, something along the lines of let me or let us. The jussive is third person. It expresses a, a weak command or a strong wish. So you'll typically translate it, may someone do something. May you give me a subscription to my channel. Now, just as we have seen nouns can have a construct form or an absolute form, Infinitives, which are verbal nouns, can also have construct and absolute forms. Typically, Hebrew infinitive constructs are translated with the word to, to study. Because it functions like a noun, it could be the subject, it could be an object. Infinitive absolutes can partner with other verbs to intensify those verbs. It can also function as an imperative. And it can also function with another verb to show contemporaneous, contemporaneous action. That is action that occurs simultaneously. Lastly, we have the participle. This is a verbal adjective. As a verb, it can function as an adjective and add additional color and flavor to other nouns. Verbally, it, it expresses some sort of action. Adjectivally, it's either going to be attributive, substantival, or predicative. Now, Hebrew has strong verbs and weak verbs. This has nothing to do with their actual strength. These are terms to help us understand the consonants in the verbal root. Strong verbs have no weak consonants. Weak verbs have weak consonants. What's a weak consonant? I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you, weak consonants are resh or gutturals, aleph, ayin, he, chet. Now there's also yod and nun, which are considered weak consonants when they begin the word. And then only in certain conjugations, biconsonantal roots, are also weak. Biconsonantal means there's only two consonants. Geminate verbs are weak. Geminate is when the second and third consonants are identical. Now we're gonna focus on strong verbs first. Then we're gonna look at weak. When we are talking about weak verbs, you'll see the Roman numerals one or two 
or three, that lets you know that this is a weak verb where the consonant in the first, second, or third position is weak. Remember, we look right to left. First position is far right, second position is middle, third position is far left. Look at amad. This is a first guttural with an ayin. Look at ga'al. This is a second guttural with the with the aleph. Look at barach. This is a third weak verb with the chet. Look at matzah. Matzah. Third weak with the aleph. Bana. Third weak with the he. Yashav. This is a first week with the yod because the yod begins the word nafal. This is a first week because the noon begins the word Allah. This is doubly weak. We have a first week position with the ayin. We have a third week with the he, kam. This is biconsonantal, therefore it is weak. Savav. This is geminate, therefore. It is weak. Now, I alluded to it last time. VSO, verb, subject, object. That's the general word order in Hebrew. The verb typically comes first. It's followed by the subject, which is then followed by the object. Bara Elohim, et shamayim va'et ha'aretz. Literally, it's he created God with the direct object marker the heavens, and the earth. But we're not going to translate it literally. We're going to rework it for English. We are translating. There's a certain amount of interpretation that goes on in this process. Translation is interpretation. So we're going to reword it. God created the heavens and the earth. Now, I said typically, VSO, typically, generally, not always. It will not always have VSO structure. When VSO is not followed, something is being emphasized. Whatever gets placed further up in the order, meaning first, gets the emphasis. Lastly, let's talk about parsing very quickly. Parsing is the process of determining the verb's stem, tense, person, number, gender, and its lexical form followed by its not wooden translation, but its dynamic translation. So if we look at the Cal Shema, Cal, perfect, third person, masculine gender, singular from Shema, meaning he heard. Cal, perfect, third, masculine, singular, Shema, he heard. Now, what is the lexical form? Ah, that's simple. It's the Cal, perfect, third, masculine, singular. So when you learn your vocabulary, you are literally looking at the Cal, perfect, third, masculine, singular. Now, biconsonantal verbs will actually be a different form. Biconsonantals use the infinitive construct. So that's it for an introduction to verbs. Buckle up. We're going to be in for a great ride, starting with Cal next time. I hope you found this video helpful. If you watch this video here, you can learn all about Hebrew numbers, cardinal numbers, and ordinal numbers. Until next time.